Welcome to our experience today. Today we're continuing in the study of the Acts of the Apostles written by Dr. Luke. It's a comprehensive history of the church from Pentecost through the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. What we have seen in our study is that right from the very beginning, uh, this church, and the church is actually better described as an uh, assembly or a fellowship, it's truly unstoppable. And that's why we have named the study of the book of Acts Unstoppable. Today we'll begin in chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles, get them ready. We're going to be in chapter 9, beginning in the very first verse. And we're going to be looking at the conversion of the Pharisee named Saul. You know, few stories in the Bible are as amazing as this story. Now, typically, uh, we start every conversation with a look at the context of the scriptures. And today I want to give you some additional information. And that additional information is on the culture of at the time that, that this is happening, during the time of Jesus and the apostles and, and Saul. I want, to, I want to paint the picture for you of what the culture is like. You know, culture is so important. Um, if, you take, if, you, if you like old movies, if you look at the movies of the 1930s and the 1940s, you'll see a couple things. Number one, that technology is greatly improved today. Uh, but at the same time, look at the way the people are, are dressed, the way they interact with each other, how they, they talk. And, and what we see is the contemporary culture has changed. And let me tell you, contemporary culture is extremely important, especially if you want to uh, be able to, to communicate a message. The culture of the first century in the Middle East, the area that extends as, as far north as present-day Turkey, as far south as, as Egypt, um, that includes all of Judah and Syria and Jerusalem, the culture was very Greek, uh, what the Bible refers to as Hellenistic. What many don't realize, the extent of the Greek culture. Uh, it extended all through this Middle East and, and actually uh, the vast majority of the Eastern Roman Empire. You see, there was a young man named Alexander that assumed the throne of his father, Philip II, uh, back in 30, 356 BC at the age of 20. And within a few years, this, this man Alexander took his, his father's uh, very competent army and he went and he conquered Persia, he conquered the entire Persian Empire. And that he wasn't done because over the course of another 10 years or so, he conquers all of Babylon, Syria, Ju Judah, Egypt, and into India. Now, there are two things of note uh, for our study today. First is that while most of the remaining Greek empire was ultimately conquered by the Romans uh, back about 150 years before that, 150 uh, BC, the Greek culture was still uh, uh, prevalent. It was the Greek culture that gave us our concept of uh, democracy, our theaters, our, our modern Olympic competitions, and, and philosophy. The greatest contributing influence of the Greeks in this time during Paul was the Greek language. It was the Greek language that was the, the most common language throughout much of what we know as the Eastern Roman Empire. The second thing of note here was that the rise of the Greek Empire, including the defeat of the Persians and then the defeat of the Greeks by the Romans, was all part of a prophecy that, the, uh, the, that uh, Daniel uh, gave uh, when he was interpreting a dream of Nebuchadnezzar's. Remember, he saw, Nebuchadnezzar saw a statue that had a head of gold, chest of arms, of silver, uh, belly and things of, of, bre of bronze, and feet of iron and clay. It was a prophecy that was so amazing, skeptics can only say that it must have been inserted into the Bible after it happened because it was, was so accurate. You know, when we see prophecy, we should immediately remember that God is, is sovereign. God is the only one that raises up kings and, and kingdoms and brings them down. It's the same God that raises up prophets and apostles. It's God that's doing the work, and we'll see that very clearly today as we talk about this conversion of Saul. Jesus was a, was a Jew. 
and, and Jesus had said that salvation is of the Jews. However, it's also clear when you read the scriptures that the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ was to be taken from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria and all the outer parts of the earth. The Bible is clear that the church would be comprised of both Jew and Gentile, slave and free, men and women, barbarian and Greek. Jesus and nearly all the apostles were not only from Israel, but they were from a, a very small town in, in Galilee. Not only was the culture of the Jews very distinct, very different than the Greek culture, but these men from Galilee were even more distant, more distant from the Greek. Beginning with the selection of the first deacons, the, the church began to appoint Greek-speaking Jews. These were Hellenists to positions of leadership and, and service, the, the first deacons, for example. Today, we know this attempt as, as diversity, and we embrace diversity in order to get our message, our products and goods and services into other cultures. God is going to do that very thing today in this message. He's going to reach down, and in an act that is completely sovereign, his will, not man's, we're going to see the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, this Pharisee that would be called the Apostle Paul. So let's read these 19 verses in the ninth chapter of Acts. I hope that you have your Bible and we're ready to, you're ready to take some notes. So let's begin in verse 1. Then it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were in the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so that he may receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Uh, on the road to Damascus, likely it's around 32 AD, Saul and his companions were struck down by a blinding light. Saul hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You know, this by far, by far is the most dramatic conversion that's recorded in the Bible. There is nothing that is close, not only in the Bible, but, but ever since. There are likely a number of people that if they've been converted to Christianity, had they been converted to Christianity, you could say that their conversion was dramatic, awesome, almost unbelievable. Uh, one of the people that comes to mind is Madeline Murray O'Hare, the famous atheist 
who got Bible reading kicked out of public schools here in the United States back in 1963. Her son, who actually ended up becoming an evangelical pastor, said this woman, his mother was, and I quote, an evil person for not, re an evil person, not just for removing prayer from America's school, no, she was truly evil. You know, her son, whose name is Bill, did something his mother would loathe. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. Think, if this evil woman, as her son describes her, who hated God and Christianity, had been converted before she died, that, we would say, would be dramatic, awesome, almost unbelievable. One more example. What if Adolf Hitler... What if Adolf Hitler had been converted and repented of his occultism and hate? And what if six million Jews that died, uh, that were systematically murdered, um, as re would have been saved as a result of, of Hitler's conversion? If that had happened, we would say that would be truly dramatic, awesome, almost unbelievable. You know, today we're nearly 2,000 years removed from the conversion experience of the Apostle Paul. And unless we truly understand what Saul was doing and what he was planning, and the impact he was having at the time, we may miss here what God is, is doing. This section from the scriptures begins with the words, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, Paul, and by the way, Paul is just the, simply the, the Greek name for Saul, is one of the most important characters of history. It, it, not just history, all, not just church history, all history. Other than Jesus Christ, there's no other person that has been so influential, so prominent in the history of the world. As Paul wrote 13 of the epistles, nearly 30% of the entire New Testament, his influence continues to this very day. God sovereignly chose this man, Saul of Tarsus, to be Paul the Apostle. His chosen messenger, to not only to the Greeks, but to the people of the world. And Saul was not just a, a learned man that could be used greatly. Saul, remember, was the enemy of the church. However, while Saul of Tarsus hated the disciples of the Lord, the people of the way, as they were called, he possessed two qualifications, two characteristics that were going to be used by God. First of all, Saul loved God. He thought that what he was doing in persecuting the church, this and this, the disciples of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, Naz, Nazareth, was done for the love of God and the Jewish religion. Secondly, Paul was extremely well versed in the, in the scriptures. He had memorized much of the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. And he could quote both from the Greek version as well as the Hebrew version of the Old Testament. So our scriptures say Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Now, have you ever asked the questions, why did he hate the disciples? Why did he hate the Christ followers so much? Well, I believe part of this is because of his Greek background. This small sect of, of Jesus' disciples is, is growing. The church is expanding and exploding by the thousands, possibly the tens of thousands. And he is infuriated. This man, Stephen, went into the Greek synagogues, and, and these Greek synagogues, were they were home turf for Paul. Uh, the Greeks loved to argue. They called it rhetoric. Uh, as defined by Aristotle, it was the great art of persuasion. And, and Saul was, was very good at it. But he couldn't out-argue Stephen. So he silenced him. Uh, now, we don't know whether or not Saul was actually the leader of the group that stoned Stephen to death. But he was there. He was complicit. Years later, Paul said this, and it's recorded in the 26th chapter of Acts. Paul says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only shut up many of the saints in prison by authority from the chief priest, but then I put them to death. I cast my vote against them and I punished them often 
in their synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even into foreign cities. So that was Saul. But let me introduce you to God. Verse 3 says, And as he, that's Paul, journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and you will be told what you need to do. Now, realize that Saul is not traveling alone. He's headed to Damascus with a large, uh, he's headed to Damascus, and Damascus is a, a large cosmopolitan Greek speaking city of about maybe 150,000. Saul is with an armed force. Likely these are temple police. His trip from Jerusalem to Damascus is, is significant. It's not a, a light undertaking. Historians tell us that as this was a group carrying provisions, it would take a better part of a, a week to travel north from Jerusalem all the way up to Damascus, through Samaria and into Syria, and, and perhaps while he was on the way, Saul, who was already angry, who was already furious, possibly heard other reports of more of the Samaritans, more of the people turning to Jesus of Nazareth. And we know that Saul's intentions were, uh, we saw him last in the previous chapter, it says he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. You know, we've had some, you have some pictures from the Renaissance period of this, this man, Saul, crumpled up on the ground with a, a bright light around him. But presently, Saul is a, a dangerous, angry, very violent man, absolutely convinced of his own self-righteousness. But here's the point. Saul is exactly where God wants him. You see, all through the Old Testament, when God did things, he often chose to make it harder, to make it more spectacular. Remember the story of Gideon. Uh, Gideon, God told Gideon to get rid of 98% of his soldiers. They went from 22,000 all the way down to 300 before Gideon was allowed to go and fight against the Midianites. God explained to Gideon that his army was too large. The Bible says, God says, if Israel should win the victory, they would say, we won it by our own might. And then the story of the Assyrians that came against King Hezekiah, the good King Hezekiah of Judah. The scriptures say that Hezekiah prayed, and then God sent an angel, and the angel destroyed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. This is our God. God is sovereign. He will act independently when he wills to do so regardless of man's intentions or actions so God says Saul Saul why are you persecuting me you see God took it personally Saul responds who are you Lord now the word Lord that Saul says here is really out of out of respect I don't believe that Saul yet knows that this is the Jehovah God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that's actually speaking to him. Saul doesn't know who it is. And we know this because the voice says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. You know, this is a, a great example of the direct sovereign will of God. We saw this in the previous chapter when we spoke about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Everything fell into place. God told Philip to go up to the Ethiopian. E the Ethiopian was already reading the book of Isaiah. Um, Philip witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch, baptizes, baptizes him, and then disappears. This is our God. This is how God saves. This is how salvation happens. You know, you may think back on your own route to conversion, your own journey, and perhaps you can recollect how you think you took the initiative. You weighed out the pros and the cons, and you decided for God. Perhaps that's your recollection, but it's always, it's always the sovereign will of God. It's always His purpose. 
This comment, by the way, kicking against the goads is almost humorous. A, the, a goad was a sharp stick that was used primarily with oxen to keep them going in the right direction. In essence, God was calling Saul a stupid and stubborn yet valuable ox. In today's vernacular, we would say that Jesus goaded Saul onto the right path. Of course, Saul doesn't know what's up. So he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? As the Lord, and the Lord tells him to go to a, to a city, and he'll be told at that time what to do. Saul's on the ground. He's blind. He, he can't see a thing. Uh, there was a bright light from heaven that blinded Saul, and of course, the Lord's voice. But the people traveling with him, the scriptures say, uh, they indicated they, they, saw, they saw something, but they, they didn't know what was going on. Now, these people, these people with Saul, led him by the hand because Saul is totally blind into Damascus. And he stays there for three days and nights, and he neither eats nor drinks. So, so what do you think Saul was doing during these three days? Well, remember, Saul was charging these people, the people that he was persecuting, uh, with heresy because they were claiming that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. Now, Saul had likely heard not only Stephen, but probably had heard Peter as well on the day of Pentecost. He'd heard what they said about Jesus, the Messiah. He luckily was there when Stephen said at the very end of his, of his sermon, I see him, the Son of Man, standing at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, Stephen had out-argued Saul and all of the others and had shown through the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah, that, he had, that Jesus had died as a, as a sacrifice for our sin. Saul went over and over this brief encounter in his mind during these three days. And especially the voice, the voice had said, Saul, Saul. The Lord repeated his name twice. And the Lord said, why are you persecuting me? Could this be true? Saul's got to be thinking, could this possibly be true? Saul was not persecuting a sect, a group of heretics, but he was actually persecuting the people that believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And then there was also this word that the Lord spoke. He said, why? Why are you persecuting? Is it possible that Saul was full of zeal without knowledge? This is what the Pharisees taught. They said, you don't want to be full of zeal without knowledge. And then there's the clincher. The voice says, I am Jesus. Saul had only two choices. Uh, either everything that Stephen and Peter had said was true, uh, Jesus was the Christ, and it was the risen Jesus of Nazareth that was speaking to him. Or the other possibility is that Saul's just hallucinating. He's a, he's a crazy man. But here it was, three days, no food, no water, and Saul was still blind. And the scriptures say that Saul was praying. <laughs> I love that. So next, we're introduced to one of my favorite people in the Bible. I know I say that about a lot of people in the Bible, but I really like this guy, Ananias. The scripture says that Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, I'm here, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight. Inquire in the house of Judas for one named Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying, and in a vision, he's, I'm sending him a man named Ananias who will put his hands on him so that he may receive his, his sight. Uh, the reason I love Ananias is because he's a, what we would call a, an average Joe, a, an ordinary man. He wasn't selected as one of the seven. He wasn't one of the apostles. There was nothing necessarily extraordinary about him, except he's part of God's plan. God had been working completely independently up to now, and truth be told, God could probably accomplish what he needs without Ananias, but he chose Ananias to use Ananias for a purpose that God sovereignly sought. Uh, the other reason I love this man Ananias is because he had some doubts. Ananias asked the right question. He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? After the Lord told him what to do, very specifically what person, where he would be, what his address was, um, what Saul would be doing, Ananias replied, kind of sheepishly, sheepishly. He said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to the saints that are in Jerusalem. He has authority 
from the chief priest to, to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord is gracious to Ananias and said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles. Now, Ananias' object, ob objection is, is perfectly logical. And it's well stated, well founded. But the scriptures are not kind to those who, who talk back to God. Ananias obviously had a, a good heart for God. And God reassures Ananias that it's all part of the plan. Ananias gathers up some courage, follows the instructions of the Lord, and lays his hands on Saul. You know, it's interesting that this is so early, literally only a few years since the Holy Spirit had descended at Pentecost, but the people know exactly about the laying on of hands. Ananias says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, it's interesting, some people question when, and, uh, and, uh, when Saul was converted, but here it is, right here. It's when he's filled with the Spirit. The Bible says that it's the Holy Spirit that indwells the life of the believers. Uh, we, in, the, in the parable of the foolish virgins, we said that the foolish virgins were foolish because they didn't carry oil with them. And oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. That was Saul receives the Holy Spirit, and he's healed of both his physical blindness as well as his spiritual blindness. This is, a, this is a great picture of salvation. The blind man gains his sight. Scales fall from his eyes. Through the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit comes into the sinner's life, and the Spirit is quickened. The man is born again. And it's sudden. It's immediate. It's like the wind. You, can, you can't see it coming or going, but you can feel the effect of it. Dr. Luke adds this story of Saul just at the, at the right time. Persecution had broken out, and some chose to flee, but some chose to stay. Each person had to respond in his own way, but notice it's the Lord that is ultimately in charge here. We said that the church is unstoppable, and the story today is a clear example of why the church is unstoppable. The lesson ends today with these words, Then he, Saul, took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he spent time with the disciples who were in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. Now, according to tradition, Ananias is said to be a bishop of the growing church in Damascus. In the official attendance at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, where we receive the Nicene Creed, the church and the bishop of Damascus was mentioned prominently. And despite the Muslim conquest of Syria in the 7th century, Damascus continues to this day to have a considerable Christian population. It's obvious that God is still in control. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you today for this, this message, this story of the conversion of Saul. We thank you, Lord, that Paul the Apostle was, um, was selected by you to be this, this great apostle so that he could reach out to the Greeks and ultimately to us as well. And we give you all the praise and the glory for that in Jesus' name. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you could do us a favor, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, if you'd like to help us, one of the things you could do is to like the video, share it, but be sure to subscribe. Uh, we need a number of subscribers in order for our video to, be, to come up as one of the selections when people are searching for, for scriptures, for finding ways to get close to God. So thank you again. Our website's at www.faithdialogue.org. You'll find all of our sermons on there, all of our audio podcasts as well. If you'd like to connect with us, just click on the connect button. God bless and have a great day.